training. Definitely. Hi, how are you doing today? It's Keith with another fantastic Star Trek review. I've got a guest reviewer with here with me today. His name is Joe. How are you doing? Howdy. Today we're going to be reviewing the seventh season, Next Generation episode, Force of Nature. Joe, would you like to care to explain the plot of the episode? Well, um, the episode starts and uh, Data's having some problems with this cat and uh, the Enterprise is out. You know, They're looking for this ship called the Fleming and it seems to have gone missing and uh, they're searching around this corridor trying to figure out where this ship's gone and you know they hear that a, that a Ferengi vessel you know might have some idea where it's at so they uh, come across this Ferengi vessel and it's uh, completely disabled and uh, then chaos ensues. Mm -hmm. The uh, the Ferengi foreshadow what, hap what will end up happening to the uh, Enterprise as it travels through the uh, space corridor on the searching for the Fleming and uh, and then they find out that the ships are becoming disabled because a group of rogue scientists are purposefully disabling the ships to bring cause to their attention. They're claiming that warp drive is basically having environmental disasters happen in this area of space. They're more or less a futuristic version of Al-Qaeda. They're warp terrorists. They're warp terrorists. I like that. But, uh, but it turns out that they're right as one of them. After her uh, plans, you know, after her research requests have gone, you know, through delays, she takes matters into her own hands and basically blows up space. Yeah, she just got a little impatient and she didn't want to have to, you know, prove her case. You know, she, well, she did prove her case, but she didn't want to have to prove her case through conventional methods, so she just went up and overloaded the warp engine on her own ship and uh, created a giant rift. Yeah. And all hell breaks loose. It took... It was a big hassle, but, you know, eventually Enterprise came out on top at the end. Uh, what did you think of this uh, story? Well, um, it's, you know, it's kind of a an analogy, obviously. Um, you know, the writers probably, you know, this episode is from the early 1990s, but they were probably already aware of the, uh, the climate change debate that was already sort of going on. So this, this episode... Uh, may have very well been a, a, an analogy for the global warming situation that we may or may not be facing on Earth today. And it, you know, kind of speaks to that stuff, saying, you know, well, a lot of people who, you know, dispute global warming say, well, you can't prove it. And the people who, you know, do believe in global warming says, well, maybe we can't prove it definitively, but we have a strong feeling that, you know, uh, what we're doing is damaging the Earth. In this case, the same thing, you know, these scientists couldn't prove their theory without, you know, really going through to an extreme measure and blowing up their ship to just, you know, to the, to show that if you use warp drive too often over the same part of space that a rift will, you know, open up. It's a good thing no crazy scientists just figure out a way to blow a gigantic hole in our ozone layer at once. Well, that would be pretty much analogous to what happens in this episode. It would be a good movie, though. Yeah, well, that, yeah, I'd, I'd watch that movie. Um, yeah, Star Trek does love to do these uh, analogy episodes. It's a staple of Star Trek. I don't know if I'd say that this is one of my favorite ones, though. I don't know if they uh, executed as well as I would like. It sure is entertaining, though. Well, it poses an interesting question uh, because of, you know, is it ever okay to go to extreme measures to, you know, prove your point? And that's, you know, a lot of what Jordy dealt with after the one scientist goes and blows himself up to prove their point is he actually felt really bad about it and he was just sort of you know at odds with himself how he could have looked over all the research that the scientists had performed and not have come to the same conclusions that they had and Jordy was in, you know just upset that he, he could be wrong about something being the warp drive expert that he is hmm. well that being said even though uh, the female scientist ended up proving her uh, research there was a lot of unanswered questions in this episode, wasn't there? There were. There were. Um, one of the first things I noticed, and you know, this is probably something that's happened in a bunch of different Star Trek Next Generation episodes, but I noticed in this one 
is Data gets some food for his cat at the replicator. And not only does it replicate the food, but it replicates a bowl for the food. And to which I wonder, are they replicating a new bowl every time, you know, they have to feed themselves? Is there like, a, a you know, a dishwashing bay on the Enterprise? Do these just get thrown into some sort of, you know, machine that, you know, breaks them down in their core components and feeds that energy back into the ship to replicate new things? It's never quite explained. Yeah, I, I don't know if they really do fully explain that. I think probably, I'd have to imagine there's sort of, some sort of matter reclamation thing going on. Perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps. And, you know, there's a lot of other things going on that aren't really clear either. You know, the cat that Data's feeding, you know, you start the episode and Jordy's watching Data's cat and Data comes to pick him up and Jordy's expressing how he's having, you know, a hard time, you know, with uh, Data's cat's behavior, Spot's behavior. How about a phaser? A low stun setting at just the right moment might do the trick. Jordy, I cannot stun my cat. I was kidding, Data. And then, you know, he suggests that Data train the cat, and Data starts trying to train the cat, but as soon as the aliens show up and the Enterprise starts experiencing all these problems, we don't hear anything more about the cat. We never know if the cat learned to behave better, if he learned to get down off Data's uh, console when told. Spot. 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 Down. Spot. Down. Down. Spot. Down. This is down. Down is good. It just gets left. I thought it was kind of funny because I, re I had remembered this episode before. You know, I've seen it before today, obviously. Not only did I not remember this, the cat, you know, subplot, but... Like, I was surprised at how much of the episode that subplot took up. Like, literally, it's almost like the first half of the episode. Right, and then they completely <laughs> then let it, just, it go. You never, you never find out anything. I hope, you know, for everyone's sake involved, that Spot's a little bit better behaved than he was at the beginning of this episode. There's also some, you know, aspects of a technical nature that were kind of confusing. Uh, later on in the episode, you know, we didn't really go into it, but after, you know, after the scientists has blown up their ship there's still the issue of finding the Fleming which is unfortunately inside this rift that the scientist just created and the you know Enterprise has to get there and in doing so they nearly tear the ship apart so much so they even cite at one point that the uh, forces on the hull are 120 percent of tolerance and that just struck me as kind of strange because how much does the Starfleet lowball the specifications on their ship? I mean, 105, 107% even, I might believe that the ship could escape that unscathed, but 120%, uh, you'd, ex you'd expect the ship to break apart. Well, yeah, clearly, if, if once you get to 120% of maximum tolerance, then it's obviously not your maximum tolerance. Right, if I say this, you know, board can, you know, this is 100% of the weight limit this board can hold, and I put 120% on it, that board's going to break. Why didn't the Enterprise break up? Well, we know why I would kind of, you know, it was the seventh season, but they didn't want to end it quite like that. Well, they had a couple movies they had to create. They up. did, but so. And, you know, then there's also the issue at the very end, um, you know, after, you know, they, they rescue the Fleming, they escape the rift, you know, they're going over the research with the, the one remaining scientist, the one who didn't blow himself up, the brother of the one who did. And they get a message from Starfleet saying that, you know, from now on, because of this, you know, new information, you know, they're going to, you know, limit uh, warp to only essential travel. And when it's not essential, they're going to limit they're going to limit warp to, to only warp five. Uh, just to, you know, so they slow down the damage that they're creating to space. And Worf immediately chimes in that the Klingon Empire will respect this warp speed limitation, but do not expect the Romulans to do the same. And I just couldn't figure out how Worf was so, you know, able to speak so quickly on behalf of the entire Klingon Empire and what, you know, their, their own fleet of ships would do. Yeah, it's literally, it's really, it's, it's an awkward film scene because it's literally like Picard's handed something like, oh, we just got this uh, Warp 5. Wow, that's as fast as we can go now. And then Warp's like, yeah, yeah, the Klingons will follow that too. Like, yeah, that really is kind of silly. We've received new directives from the Federation Council on this matter. 
Until we can find a way to counteract the warp field effect, the Council feels our best course is to slow the damage as much as possible. Therefore, areas of space found susceptible to warp fields will be restricted to essential travel only, and effective immediately, all Federation vessels will be limited to a speed of warp five. Well, the Klingons will observe these restrictions, but the Romulans will not. And what about the Ferengi? But I think one of, one of my technical problems with this episode, we, we were discussing the how they had to rescue that ship from inside that rift. And because of this rift, the way it was formed, they couldn't use their warp engines. Because if they were if they were to create a warp field, it would expand the rift even further. And the data came up with the solution of basically just using like two minutes worth of warp just to get them to go fast enough and then kind of coast through, beam up the survivors on the Fleming, and then just hopefully make it through the rift on their way. I don't think that's how warp drive works. I mean, I could be wrong, but I mean, in order to be at warp speed, I think you have to have warp drive engaged because it creates a warp field. It's not like you can get like a running start or, you know, it's not like that. I think once the warp warp, warp field is dropped, you're, you're going sublight. But And how much can we trust any of Jordy's ideas anyway, considering he looked at the research of the scientists and was unable to come to the correct conclusion that excessive use of warp drive would damage space? I mean... Well, I mean... It worked. It did work. But would you trust them after that? Well, I mean, they were the... I mean, Data and Jordy are the probably the two best warp theory specialists that they have on the ship at the time. So if you're going to trust anybody, I mean, it's better than asking Worf what he thinks we should do. I uh, should have asked the scientist whose sister blew himself up. Well, he helped a little. Well, he, he did. He did some. He seemed some. really un, unaffected by his sister's death, too. I, that oh, he, he did a pretty good job sucking it up and pulling it I mean, together. I guess, I guess he had a, a yeah. time of crisis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I think it's about time we uh, wrap it up here, give this a rating. I think I'm going to rate it a Warp 7. I thought it was enjoyable, you know, pretty good for a Season 7 episode, if I must say, but probably not some of uh, Next Generation's best. Uh, what would you rate it, Joe? I'm going to give this episode a Warp 5 in light of the new uh, Warp Speed restrictions set forth by Starfleet. Um, I'm just really concerned about the actions my own Warp use can have on the universe around me, and I want to be conscious of that after seeing this uh pretty enlightening episode. Very responsible of you, Joe. Very responsible. All right, thank you for watching, everybody. I want to help tell all my fans, go check out my new podcast. Head on over to geekbattle.com. I'll put a link in the description. And uh, everybody, thanks. 